what we as Christians are called to do. The Great Commission is to take the gospel to every person of every people in every place in his passion, his love, his power, his authority, his power, his strength. It's not anything I can do for them. Uh, and all that's got to be prefaced by prayer. But I think if we look out across the country, we'd see that our country is in need of revival. All right? I can give you some statistics that would uh, amaze you. 80% of our country professes to be, uh, you know, to believe the Bible. And yet uh, we have 143 million people in the country who profess to be lost and unchurched. That's how they describe themselves. I'm not part of a church. And I'm lost. All right. But when we go to do the Great Commission, often we want to. I know some pastors around the country that have quit having a friend day. You say, well, why? Well, friend day used to be a very important day. It's an evangelistic day. We we brought a, a preacher friend of mine calls it frangelism. He, he said, friends, relatives, associates, and neighbors bring them to church that day. But what it has turned into in so many places, if we're going to invite somebody from from the church down the street to come here because it's friend day and we want our friends from down the street to come here rather than outreach. And I think the problem with that is the church. Okay? So you said, you ain't never been here before. You don't know what our problems are. Well, no, I don't. But I know what the Lord laid on my heart to preach. And I'd like you to turn with me to uh, Psalm 85. And we're going to read one verse of scripture there and uh, I'm going to quote some others to you. I'll tell you where they are so that you can look them up and see that uh, I'm not using them inappropriately. I'm going to read you three verses of scripture. One here, one in Peter and one in Corinthians. Uh, I'm going to give you a moment to turn and then I'm going to open this prayer. Paul was being led of the Holy Spirit to write there in 1 
Corinthians chapter 11, God chastens his people. In fact, uh, there's so many people today who profess to be saved, and they're in all manner of sin. Uh, in fact, if you look at at uh, if you look at divorce rates, if you look at fornication, which is sex before marriage, if you look at drinking, if you look at drug use, if you look about any sin in the Scripture, you'll find that the occurrences of such sins within the congregation of God calls themselves God's people is not much different than it is out in the world. That's a problem. And what Paul is writing here is if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. In other words, like my children, if they drive the foolishness away, then God doesn't have to. Uh, we're all looking to praise and worship the Lord, right? I mean, we see services that are labeled. It's a praise and worship service. But by example, the Bible teaches us that not everybody can truly praise and worship the Lord. Okay? It's truly taught from cover to cover. That not everybody can worship the Lord. Jesus told the old wild woman at the well. He said, why you call her a wild woman? Well, he said, where's your, go get your husband. She said, I have no husband. He said, you've well spoken. You've had five, and the one you got now, you're not married to. Oh, I'd say that qualifies as a wild woman. And he said to her, God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in <coughs> Truth. God doesn't want us to play church. Amen. Okay. But if we go and look at the law, so this is New Testament, go all the way back to the Old Testament. If you were to take the time to look in Leviticus chapter 9, that chapter ends with a wave offering. And that's God's people waving praise and worship to the Lord. But what is it? What precedes that wave offering? Well, if you look just before that wave offering, there's the peace offering. And the peace offering says, Lord, we are completely satisfied in your salvation and in your sustenance. We're completely satisfied that you've not only saved us from sin, but you sustain us day by day from trial and temptation and so forth. Satisfied. Everybody's looking for satisfaction. And we want to go straight to the praise and worship to get the satisfaction, those of us who call ourselves Christians. But not everybody can praise and worship. Not even all believers can truly praise and worship. Some great music here this morning. Really enjoy the one you wrote. That was amazing. Enjoy the song the preacher sang. Enjoy the two songs y'all sang. It's amazing. All right? But not everybody can sing those songs. You see, if you look there in Leviticus chapter 9, the first thing is the sin offering. That's our salvation. And you can't worship God until you're saved. And to be saved, it's a simple thing. I'm glad it's not, you know, E equals MC squared or something that's out of my, my range of comprehension. It's a very simple thing for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the good news, and we understand that. And I could go around and include everybody's name in that, and it's true. He loved you. But in order to truly grasp, I mean, honestly, we have become, and I think it's human nature, I'm going to show you in a second from Scripture, that we go through cycles. But we begin to think too much of ourselves. It was almost like, well, no one he loves me. Everybody loves me. There's a, a preacher I know. If I call his name, you might know him. He's nationally known. And, and uh, after a meeting years ago, the man's uh, 72, 74 years old now. <clears throat> after a meeting when he was probably in his 50s, um, his wife sat on the front row there where Brother Joey's at, waiting as all these people came up there and, and, and said, Preacher, would you, would you sign my Bible? And they said all these nice things to him like people were so kind to do. And as they go back, he and his wife, Miss Evelyn, they'd been married about 30 years, I think, at the time. I know it was north of 20. And uh, they're walking arm in arm, you know, in the hotel there. And she said, she called him by his first name. She said, did you hear all those people say those nice, nice things? And he said, yeah, well, that was nice, wasn't it? She said, yes, honey, it was, but I just need to help you. She, he said, okay. He said, she said, don't you believe the word of it? I know. <laughs> <All right. laughs> 
because we can't be used of God if our head swells up and we think it's all about us. And honestly, I think a lot of us, maybe more so in the Bible Belt than elsewhere, I can't answer to that. But it's almost like we just believe everybody loves us, right? But we, in order to truly grasp that, we've got to go over there to Romans chapter 3 and get a taste of the fact that we're sinners. <laughs> sinners are enemies of God. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If we begin to compare ourselves amongst ourselves, you're going to pick my weak points and your strong points, and you're going to come out on top if you make the comparison. Humanly speaking, if I make the comparison, I'm probably going to pick your weak points and my strong points, and I'm going to come out on top. But when you start comparing yourself to the sinless Son of God, you don't compare, and neither do I, and we have to get a grasp on that. There's nothing good in us. The Bible says there's none good, no, not one. None seek after God. If you were seeking after God, it's because He was already seeking after God. You. You have to grasp that we're sinners. And that sin has a salary. The wages of sin is death. death. And that's not just talking about a physical death. The Bible says that death is separation. And the Bible says in, in the Revelation there that death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death or the final separation that's separated from God forever in a place of torment. And that is our just and righteous in right there. But God commended. He demonstrated. He manifested. He showed us. Everybody talks about loving him. I've had people shake my hand at the back of the church door and tell you how much they love me and then walk out right out there in the church park lot and tell them what a sorry dog I am and how I said I said the wrong words when I was baptizing somebody. Come on. I ain't heard but one set of words and I found them in scripture. I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. I don't know what other words I was supposed to use. You see how people will do They talk about love. But Jesus showed it. But why are we be yet sinners? You know, sinners means enemies of God. Christ died for us. The most amazing four words in the Bible. To be honest with you, I don't know anybody in this county that doesn't love us. But that's not enough for you to be saved. Amen. There has to come a time when you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth and you call out. And the first step to being able to praise and worship is to be saved. If I truly believe I'm drowning in sin and headed for hell, how can I but grab on to the rope that Jesus offers us called salvation? The first step to being able to truly praise and worship, the first step to being totally right with God is to be saved. But that's called the new birth and it's lifestyle. A friend of mine, Dustin uh, Moffat, his wife Kimmy, had a baby this weekend in Avery. If that baby doesn't, isn't, well, it's nine pounds, a big old baby, right? Or almost nine pounds. But if that baby's not 10 pounds next month, we're going to think something's wrong, right? If that baby's not walking in, in 12 to 18 months, we're going to think something's wrong. But how many of us profess to, to, to have been born again, but we're still these little bed babies that have to be spoon-fed, have to be stick a bottle in our mouth? Come on, the, 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 the next step is being totally surrendered. The burnt offering there was totally consumed, some in the camp, some outside the camp. New Testament, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, completely submitted to him. So the second step is surrender. The third step is the meat offering. Now, if you look up meat, we, 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 you and I, we think of, of red meat, right? We think of fish. We think of some flesh that we're going to eat. But meat in itself, that the first de definition in, in the dictionary is sustenance. If you look up what that meat offering was, it was cornbread. It was meal and oil fried in a pan. And they gave that to God's word. Some of it was crumpled into the fire on the altar, and the preacher got to eat the rest of it. Supporting the, the, the work of God with our money, with our mouth, and with our manpower. This is where we're thoroughly right with God. This is where we can say we're satisfied in God. This is where we're saved, surrendered, and supporting the local work. This is where we can say we're satisfied in thee. This is where we can truly praise and worship God. But mankind, from Adam forward, as individuals and corporately as the people of Israel, as 
this country, as that country, as local churches within a country go through cycles. Totally right with God. Complacent. In sin. In bondage to sin. We realize it and we call out for help. And God forgives us. Puts us back. Thoroughly right with God. As peoples, as individuals, that could last moments. It could last days. It could last weeks. It could last years. As a people, it typically lasts a generation or two. You look through the book of Judges and it lasts about 20 to 20 to 40 years. That cycle is about a 40 year cycle. Boom. 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 I don't have time to preach it this morning, but if you look at our history from the Great Awakening forward, we're looking at about a 20 to 40 year cycle. We're right with God. We get idle, complacent. We get into sin. We call out for help. We get right with God. We get idle, complacent, into sin. We call out for help. About 20 to 40 years. Boom. We're on the back side of that 40. It's about time. It's about time to hear the trumpet, or it's about time for a revival. And it, I, I'm, I'm ready for either one. But if I'm not going to hear the trumpet, I want to see a real revival. I'm not talking about a series of meetings. I'm talking about where God's people get thoroughly right with God, and we begin to become evangelistic. Because I hear people, people often pray, well, we're done. Uh, let, me, uh, let me have opportunity to witness. Friend, you pass people every day who are lost and going ahead. Yeah. We don't need opportunity. We just need the gumption to take advantage of the opportunity he gives us. If you look at, you know, we talked about this. How many times did the, I'm talking about this cycle now. I, I want you to get a good hold on this cycle. Remember the patriarchs. How many times, God told them not to go to Egypt. How many times they go to Egypt? How many times they go to Egypt? Abraham went to Egypt. Abraham went to Egypt. Isaac. Jacob. You get into the whole country. The whole family went to Egypt. And they stayed there 400 years. So they didn't have that 40 year cycle then. It's on and on and on. A lot of people. David. David went through this. I, I got to throw David at you because I, I, I can't tell you how many times David's name comes up. And because. There's sin in the camp. There's sin in the church. Now, hopefully it's not here. But there's sin in the church. That's why millennials don't want to come. Millennials, anybody born from 1980 to 1999, and many of them don't want to come to church because they know you want to pick on them for their sins. I want to pick on them for their sins, but we don't want to clean up our own lives. So I've heard people time and again use David as a See, the problem is that divorce, adultery, fornication, all this stuff that happens is often with God's people. As it does out there. And people say, well, David, David was a man after God's own heart. And David was an adulterer. He was. Did God forgive him? Yes, he did. Was his life ever the same? I challenge you. You read his life after that. No victories from that point forward. No victories. Because, because influence is like trust. And once you lose that trust, once you lose that influence, it's never going to be the same. It's never going to be the same. David's life, that he repented, God forgave him, but God doesn't take away the earthly consequences. His first child, born to Bathsheba, out of the adultery, died. Amnon raped his half-sister. Her whole brother, Absalom, killed Amnon. These are all three of those are, are David's children. Absalom wanted the throne, and David's sin with Bathsheba was secret. Absalom did the, rest, the same thing publicly with David's other wife besides his mother. Later in life, there's a fellow walking down the road beside David, and he's kicking dust on him, and he's cussing him, and he's spitting on the ground, and Joab wants to kill that dog. David said, leave us alone. Reckon why? That was Bathsheba's daddy. Bad she daddy. I got chill bumps. When you, when we step in it, 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 it has consequences. 
And I believe the churches across this country have stepped in it. And we're on the back end of that 40 years, and God wants to send a revival. <coughs> Listen, we sit inside our church houses and we complain about the sin of society. But David wrote, excuse me, Paul wrote, I have written unto you not to keep company. Let's, let's turn over and read that together. First Corinthians chapter 5. Help me, Lord. There's no clock in here, and so I'm trying not to be long-winded, but I got to get in high gear because I have no clock by which to judge how long-winded I'm being. Amen. First Corinthians chapter 5. That's wrong. That's one of the same First Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says. I wrote in verse number 9, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, verse number 10, yet not altogether with the fornicators of the world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters, for then you must needs go out of the world. The only way you can not talk to people in sin is to go to heaven. But now have I written unto you not to keep company if any man that's called a brother be a fornicator, covetous, idolater, railer. What are these things? These are sins, clearly. Fornication is, is uh, basically sexual sins. Covetous is desiring things that aren't rightfully ours. Idolaters, putting things before God. A railer is somebody who can take their tongue and rip their guts out and feel good about doing it. How many people do we know who profess to be Christians that will do that regularly? I just say what I think. Well, the Bible says that the thought is wicked. We don't necessarily have to say everything that we think. Drunkards, extortioners, that's for all. If you look in my Bible, it's on the same page. Uh, it may not be on yours, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, in verse number 9, it says, Know ye not, the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Hmm. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, there's that sexual sin, that's sex without a marriage contract, nor idolaters, that's putting something before God, nor adulterers, that's breaking a marriage contract, nor effeminate, that's uncertain gender, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, those two are basically talking about LGBTQ, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, there's that taking your tongue, ripping somebody's guts out, nor extortioners, that's fraudulent, shall inherit the kingdom of God, and such were some of you, but you're washed, you're sanctified, you're justified. Listen, one step to curing anything is taking an accurate look at where we are. It's what all of us tend to do, myself included, so I'm, I'm as much preaching to me my daddy used to say it this way. If I point a finger at you, there are three points back at me. All right? What we do is we go around like the Jews. It, it is mentioned in Romans chapter 10, trying to build up our own righteousness. But the first step to cure sin and effect a revival is to take note of where we are. We are not. We as a people, maybe you as an individual might be, but as a people in these United States, those of us who profess to follow after Christ, we are no longer just complacent. We are in sin. Well, why do you say that, Brother John? Well, arrogance is sin. Idleness is sin. Uh, 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 being, judge, being judgmental, being better than you is sin. That falls under arrogance, I guess. We're in the sin. And it's easy for us to sit in here and we can point at all that sin out there. But what God is wanting us to do is to look in the mirror of God's Word and take an adequate account of where we are. Amen. Where we are. So then what do we do, Brother John? Well, the Old Testament says it this way. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. You see, we can't affect them when we're arrogant. We can't affect the lost people. We've got to humble ourselves and pray. Did you pray before you left home this morning? Did you pray when you faced temptation? Did you pray? I don't remember the other two verses, but that's a very actual song. I asked a young man this week who was making a, a life-changing decision, and I called him by his whole name. He's not my child, but I know all three of his names, and I said, have you prayed about no, sir. I said, well, let's sit down and let's write down the pros and cons to 
this side of the decision and that side of the decision because both of them have good points and both of them have bad points. And then tonight you can pray about that. So the next day I said, well, I called him by his whole name again. I said, you can pray about that. No, sir, I don't have time to pray through the week. I said, son, this is a life-changing decision. You need to make time to talk to the Lord about this. You see that? It's easy for us to point at that teenager, but how many of us take time to pray through the week? How many of us spiritually fast from Sunday to Sunday? How many of us don't open our Bibles between Sunday and Sunday? How many of us don't seek the Lord from Sunday to Sunday? We seek the Lord. We use the Lord. I don't have one in my pocket. I don't know why we call it lucky. It certainly wasn't lucky for the rabbit. But, you know, we, we like to use the Lord like a rabbit's foot, right? We pull him out when we got a difficulty. That's not revival. That's not the victorious Christian life. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. That's repentance. That's all those steps from Leviticus chapter 9. I'm saved. I'm surrendered. I'm supporting the local work. And I'm satisfied. Then I'll heal from heaven. Then I'll forgive their sins. Then I'll hear their land. The New Testament, it says it in an even simpler fashion. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. I'm going to close with this verse right here because I, I, I'm pleased this point with what Brother Joey has told me the Lord is doing here and I want to see the Lord do even more and I'm sure he does and I hope you do. But did you know, remember those, you, you're pretty young there, but do you remember those posters I bet you see in the pages where it's got a white bearded man that says, Uncle Sam wants you. Have you seen those in history class? Did you know it, was, it is an adequate thing for us to, us to replace Uncle Sam's name with God Almighty? Won't you? But we talk about super Christians, but there's really no such thing as a super Christian. There's a disobedient Christian, and according to Romans chapter 12, there's a reasonable Christian. It's only reasonable that we present our bodies a living sacrifice. So how does Uncle Sam want me? How does the Lord want you? The Bible said the eyes of the Lord run to and fro. Now, the English language has devolved since this Bible I used was translated in 1611. For us to say it today where you can understand it and with no doubt unless you're a crazy person that likes language like I do. It is the eyes of the Lord are continually running forever throughout the whole earth to prove himself strong on the behalf of them whose heart is perfect for thee. That perfect doesn't mean without sin, thank God, or none of us would ever fit that be. What that perfect is, is I'm tuned in on him and his will precedes my will, or as John the Baptist wrote, you must increase and I must decrease. Do you want to see a revival? Do you want to see our county come back to Christ? Do you want to see our country come back to Christ? Well, here's the thing we've got to get a hold of. We can't do anything about them out there until we as individuals get thoroughly right. I can't do anything on the mission field if I'm not thoroughly right with God. And you can't do anything in Nettleton, Dorsey, Smithville, all the different locations that are represented here this morning until you as an individual are thoroughly right with God. And he's standing there just like that prodigal son standing with open arms. What did he say? Give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. He's waiting for you. He's waiting for me. Will you come to him? See, I've already said yes, but will you get thoroughly right with God so that you can not only praise and worship him in spirit and in truth, but be an effective witness for him in our community?
Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the privilege of preaching here this morning. I pray you take this simple message, Lord. I thank you for pruning me and working on my life.